welcome back. Time for another episode of Revenue Optimization Radio. Brought to you today by the good folks, Upland Altify, the sales transformation company. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Revenue Optimization Radio. We appreciate you tuning in wherever you get your podcasts. Please give us a rating and plenty of feedback. You can find me, Sean Broderick, on LinkedIn or on Twitter, so feel free to shoot me a message today. So today we're going to explore the intersection of business development and sales. And these are often functions that don't really complement each other in the way that they should, or maybe aren't even aligned towards a similar goal. And my guest today, I met her at the Digital Sales World event in Dublin in December in 2019. And I want to give a shout out to Bob Perkins, Cameron Hobbs, and everyone at the Association of Inside Sales Professionals there. She was a brilliant panelist at one of the discussions that we had uh, on the day there. And I know she's going to be a really awesome guest. So Kelly Orcutt is the Senior Manager of Business Development and MIA for Zuora. Kelly, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sean. Thank you so much for having me. Kelly, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, thank you so much. So I have been in the tech industry working in a sales capacity for the last six years. I started my career right out of university in Boston in the United States at Oracle. And at the time when I graduated, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, to be honest, but I immediately fell in love with sales. Oracle is a great company to start your career at. They give a lot of great training and you sort of understand how to become a young professional and a good salesperson. But the opportunity to join Zora came about five years ago when they were opening their Boston office. And so I moved over to Zora as a business development rep, worked there in that office for about a year and a half until the opportunity to move to London and manage our European BDR team came about and I jumped at it. I've always wanted to work abroad and I've always been interested in leadership and enablement and training. So it was a great kind of alignment of, of all of those interests. I've been in London working with that team for the last three years. And luckily for me, the team and the EMEA business for Zora has grown drastically. The team itself has tripled in size. And now I'm a senior manager who has the privilege of managing both individual contributors as well as two very strong managers. So. Awesome. That's a kind of a gutsy move coming across the pond and, and managing a, a group of uh, English or UK or EMEA based business development folks. How did they initially take an American person coming over and, and leading a team in EMEA? Oh God. I think they were very skeptical at first, honestly. <laughs> yeah, that would be um, that would be a European or a, a British or an Irish trait, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And they had every right to be skeptical. I had no management experience at the time. I was quite young to be managing a team of that size. And what really helped was I think what the leadership example that I had from the other managers in EMEA, first of all, all of the senior leaders there very much took me under their wing, which I was very lucky to have. And their example was always in order to gain the trust of your team, you have to get down in the trenches and show them that you know how to do the job too. So as a first time manager, moving from individual contributor to a leader, that was what I had to do, right? I had to show them, okay, there was a reason why I was the number one BDR globally. There's a reason why my boss, the VP of business development moved me over here. It's not just for, for kicks. And so I remember one day I had clicked right away with the only female on my team at the time. And I remember one of my best moments as a manager was in the first couple of months, she had heard from another member of the team, he'd come to her over tea and said, you know, the stuff that Kelly's showing us and the messaging and stuff, it's actually working. I've set a bunch more meetings than I would have done before. And I think it was kind of that slow process of winning them over by credibility is yeah. really, really important. But I learned that from the example of other leaders. Yeah, and there's a realization that they have a lot to learn as well from someone coming in with fresh eyes from a fresh yeah. market and a market that's, you know, historically over the last probably eight or 10 years done a lot better than the UK or EMEA markets or even the Irish market. So I think there's, there's a lot to learn on both sides. I think Zuora is a really, really interesting company. And I've had experience in the past in companies that have product catalogs, CPQ, that type of quote to cash type business. And I personally find it very interesting. And I think your customer base is also really interesting. Talk to me a little bit about Zuora and the journey that you guys have been on from a business point of view. Yes. So 
12 years ago, our CEO and founder, Teen Zuo, who was employee number 11 at Salesforce. He was their chief marketing officer before he spotted the need for Zora. He identified something called the subscription economy and this shift away from ownership to usership and from the product economy to the subscription economy. So instead of buying DVDs, all of us want to subscribe to Netflix. Instead of buying CDs, we all subscribe to Spotify. He noticed this trend and he also saw that with all of these kind of new services and, and the way that consumers wanted to buy, that was all well and good for the consumer, but launching a subscription business model introduces a lot of complexities in the back end. And he saw from his experience at Salesforce, which was one of the first great software as a service companies, that there simply just wasn't a solution that fixed these problems. So he founded Zora and Zora is an enterprise software company and we provide a SaaS order to revenue management platform for businesses primarily to launch and manage their subscription services. So we automate those complexities that come specifically in billing and revenue recognition automations, helping you keep your business agile and fast. So what I love about it is that we started as a SaaS company who primarily sold to SaaS companies. Our HQ is out of Silicon Valley, and it was a very simple subscription model. But quite quickly, we saw that that shift was also happening to the media industry. And so then we basically started working with most of the world's largest media companies. And then it started happening to the automotive industry and the retail industry. And basically, you can see now that 12 years later, and sort of five years after I joined Zora, I am such an evangelist of the subscription economy and such a believer because I've actually witnessed industries pivot and shift over the last five years and we're still seeing it happen. So yeah, it is very exciting to be a part of a company. You can, you can join any SaaS company, right? But it's exciting to be a part of a company that's actually part of a, a cultural and a global shift in the way that people do business and primarily our focus when we work with companies is on how they're going to grow. And I find that kind of sale really exciting. And I, I love working with business owners to help them solve their problems. I think, you know, a lot of companies in the subscription space will focus on a particular vertical. You know, there'll be telecom specialists or there'll be communication specialists or, you know, SaaS specialists. But I think looking at your site and looking at your customer base, it's really everybody. You look at that full list that it's such a broad customer base. And we talked about it actually before we went live on the call today around Zoom as a customer of yours. Yeah. And that's probably the hottest stock in the world right now, considering, you know, the working from home that everybody has to do these days with coronavirus. So yeah. I think you've, the customer base that you guys have is, is super interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And even as an employee, I can tell you, having been at Zora for five years, it's one of the things that keeps me invested in this company because yeah. every single year I'm learning about a new industry as each one kind of pivots to this model. So it definitely keeps you engaged and learning. Awesome. So let's jump into some of the meat of the, the topics here today. What is your view, having both experience and built up your experience in the U.S.? What's your view on the differences between working in the U.S. market versus EMEA and being based in the U.K. like you are now? Yeah. Well, I think I should say as well that when I took the job initially, I sort of moved within just a month or so of understanding that I would become the manager. So I didn't have yeah. time to go to London and test it out and see how I would feel or understand what the city was like at all. So I kind of showed up. And one thing that struck me right away about London as a city and this kind of ecosystem of tech companies that you have here is just how international it is. And how you can walk down a street in London or walk into any really big tech company and you're hearing Italian, German, Swedish, Finnish, Dutch. And that to me, as someone who's really motivated by understanding how people work and are motivated and where their stories and where they come from, it's been just an absolute joy to be around that much diversity and culture. Yeah. And I think it's been also kind of a crash course in leadership because yeah. it's one thing to communicate with someone who has your cultural background, who might look or sound exactly like you, maybe even went to the same university as you. It's a complete other thing to understand and communicate effectively with someone who has a completely different background. And 
knowing when someone is speaking from a cultural point of view or when they're speaking from a personal point of view, that's just their personality, knowing when to take something personally versus knowing when that's just the way that a certain culture operates. Sure. And vice versa. I mean, the American culture can be quite abrasive. We are a participation culture. Everyone raises their hands in meeting. I've also had to take a hard look at myself and think, God, what am I bringing into the situation to make other people feel comfortable? And I've learned so much about myself through that process as well. That's amazing. And I, and I think, you know, that, that speaks a little bit to, you talked about diversity and inclusion. And, you know, one of the reasons that for the month of March, we're trying to feature as many female sales leaders to coincide with International Women's Day just on Sunday. Talk to me a little bit about the efforts and your experience of the benefits of having a more diverse team, because, you know, we always position research that we've done where it shows that, you know, people from a more diverse background, female sales leaders have shorter sales cycles, they have higher win rates, you know, the numbers stack up as well as everything else. So talk to me a little bit about your experience of uh, diversity inclusion and the importance of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think all the data shows that having a diverse team in every sense of the word, both socioeconomic, race, gender, every single background, if you have a team that brings all these things together, you're going to have a stronger team. You're more likely to hit your revenue targets. Yeah. I've certainly seen that to be true. When I first came into the team, we had, first of all, we had a very diverse team from a cultural perspective. And I think having the Italian, German, Turkish, English point of view really did bring a lot of value. But now as I look at my team today, what we have is just uh, so many different aspects of diversity, both the things that you can see and the things that you can't see that It is certainly the top performing BDR team in the company, and it's definitely the highest potential team of future leaders for Zora that I've seen. And so I guess when I think about like a lack of diversity and times, for example, when maybe I've been the only woman in the room or I've been in a situation where pretty much everyone in the room is coming from the same background, the risk that you have is that you sort of all look at the problem the same way. You don't come up with different solutions no one challenges the status quo. And you sort of think, why would we do anything different? And you don't have anyone kind of even bringing in a little bit of discomfort into the room, which I think discomfort is really important in innovation and in generating new ideas. So yeah. Awesome. And I think, you know, before we're going to cut to a break here, I think there's one more question I want to ask you. This first section is around the role of BDRs in fast growing software companies. So one of the things I saw on your site was a quote from McKinsey, which is if a software company grows less than 20% annually, there's a 92% chance of failure. So, so growth is everything. And I think that where business development sits in the organization is really important. You know, from my organization's perspective, business development sits underneath marketing. And I know that's different in a lot of different companies. Give us an overview of where business development sits in Zuora and where you feel is the best practice, whether it should sit under sales or under marketing. I think the first thing that's important to say is that I think it depends on the company and the size of growth or the phase of growth that the company is in. I know that years ago when Zuora was an 100 person company out of Silicon Valley, we did sit under marketing. And then our one of our first kind of global BDR leaders was almost an operations leader, not a traditional BDR leader. So at a certain phase of growth, you might put it under marketing, you might put it under sales. It sort of depends on the leadership team and the priorities of the business. Today, we sit under sales. And I personally think that that's very important because I think that some of the magic that happens in having a really strong team in general cross-functionally is that bond between the BDR and the AE. So if you have a strong BDR being invested in by an AE, then you are have a recipe for success. But I will say also that one of the fundamental things, it's not just one individual or one AE, one BDR. You also need a very strong marketing partner from a field marketing perspective. And even at our scale and our size and, and the, the strategy that we have moving forward for Zora is a partner in alliances, in strategic alliances, especially as we are working with some of the largest companies in the world. There's no no company that does not have a strategic partner that they're working with, whether it be Deloitte, Accenture, what have you. So really what I've seen to work is that at Zora, especially in EMEA, we have a very strong alignment between alliances 
the BDR organization and marketing. And then because the BDR team works so closely with sales and is actually in the same sales organization, a very strong alignment with the AE. So you need the healthy tension of the gate from marketing to BDR to AE with alliances coming in at the BDR and AE level. But I think in general, if you all are focused on the same goal, you are going to get a good result. Yeah, I really agree. And I think, you know, we always talk about the revenue team here at Upland Altify. So it's it's all about team selling. So that collaboration across business development, sales, marketing, alliances, field marketing, all of those things working together is where you get the best results. And that's something we're going to touch a little bit on in the second half of the show. We're going to take a break now and pay some bills. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about sometimes where the disconnect is between business development, accountant execs, and also how we can enhance the tenure of BDRs in companies. Thank you. We live in a subscription economy. You're only as successful as your customers, and that requires a mindset shift from what's our strategy for the customer to what's our customer's strategy and how can we help. Focusing on your customer's needs and providing value in every interaction is critical to building long-term relationships and sustained sales success. The challenge for most sales leaders and their teams is their sales process doesn't match how customers buy in today's digital world. Sustained growth and sales execution are impossible because the revenue team isn't aligned with consistent process and methodology to understand their customers' people and their problems. Altify's customer revenue optimization solutions activates the entire revenue team with a combination of strategy, methodology, and applications to help companies deliver more value to their customers. The result is increased sales velocity, improved win rates, and increased customer satisfaction. With a CRO strategy, now you can effectively collaborate across the entire revenue team to win new business and unlock more cross-sell and upsell opportunities. Built natively on the Salesforce platform, Altify helps revenue leaders and their teams achieve sustained revenue growth and sales success. Visit Altify.com today to see how they help accelerate sales performance for some of the world's best sales teams including Autodesk, Comcast, GE, Honeywell, Salesforce, Tableau, and United Health Group. Welcome back to Revenue Optimization Radio. I'm here with Kelly Orcutt, the Senior Manager of Business Development EMEA at Zuora. Welcome back, Kelly. Before the break, we talked about the revenue team, the intersection of business development and sales and account executives. I think in a lot of companies, there is that disconnect with those two particular units. How do you close the gap between your business development team and the account executives who are going out there and closing deals? That's a great question. I think like so many other things, the example for that comes from the top, right? So we have some really, really strong sales leaders who are very invested not only in their team, but the cross-functional teams. And so I've found that when my relationship with those sales leaders is strong, then that trickles down and that respect and the productivity and the alignment does also trickle down to the account executives and the BDRs. And I've, we've had a great experience with that in EMEA at Zora. I also think one of the most important things from a, a BDR AE perspective from an individual contributor level is that they need to understand what accounts are we going after? Where are we dividing and conquering? What are my roles and responsibility versus your roles and responsibility? And then where are we partnering as a team, right? So the moments that I've seen that breakdown between individuals is when you have a team that's not communicating effectively, that hasn't prioritized or divided those priorities amongst each other. And again, that example can be set from the leadership team. And then finally, I think, the other very key thing, and it starts sort of even at the beginning of the funnel, is what kind of people are you hiring? Because if you hire an account executive or a BDR who fundamentally has this capacity to be coachable, who has the passion about being a team player, who's intellectually curious and who's gritty, you're going to end up building naturally a team that works well together. 
if you hire people, for example, with account executives, I think the trope that sometimes happens is that you'll have an AE who treats the BDR like an admin and has them do kind of very mundane tasks. And to be fair, at some points, you do need someone helping you with mundane tasks, right? And your team. So people do things that are quote unquote, not my job and you should. But at the same time, where I've seen the AE BDR partnership work exceptionally well is when you have an AE who's actually naturally taking on a mentorship role with the BDR and the people who typically lean towards taking a mentorship role or the people who've been mentored and who are coachable and who are asking for that investment themselves. So if you're having trouble with your team and you're seeing consistent, like misalignment type of of friction, yeah, it's probably, you should go all the way back to your hiring process and think about what kind of profile are we bringing in, in the first place. Awesome. And I think we always say here that customers are the center of your business, not the bottom of your funnel. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you look at how leads go from, you know, they start in terms of their journey, moving into qualified from business development, you need that customer focus all the way through the pipe, whether right. that's in terms of closing deals or whether that's them just downloading a white paper and, and getting onto your CRM system. So I think that's a really interesting part of the conversation as well. One of the, I think the the key pieces for a business development leader, and I want to ask you to speak to this, is how we can increase the tenure of a BDR. How can we increase that tenure of BDR? How can we get them working for companies for longer? And how can we actually put a path in place for them to become account executives and increase their earning potential over a long period of time? It is like the number one question that we see in the industry. And I think it comes from the nature of the BDR role itself, right? So I think primarily, if you're doing a BDR organization correctly and building it correctly, it's two things. It's a team of people who are building the pipeline for your sales team and for your business. And also it's building the talent pipeline for your entire business, not only into sales, but also into marketing, into HR, into finance, into any other role. I've seen BDRs at Zora move across every single cross-functional team. So the first thing to understand is that fundamentally you are going to have natural attrition in this type of role because it is oftentimes a first job out of university or a master's. It can be a pivot job into sales from another industry. And you're going to have people who are in their 20s who are trying things out they might get into the role and say, actually, this is so not for me. It is a hard job. And that's great because what that means is if you've invested correctly, you can get them to move into a different organization. Or you have people who, for example, I had a girl on my team, a woman on my team this year who ended up going from the BDR role on my team back into international development, working with NGOs and totally changed her career path back to what she was studying in university. And we still are very close and keep in touch quite frequently. So that's actually the best case scenario. Sometimes this role, you have people who are just naturally going to leave and you have to accept that as a leader, right? Sure. But the way that you actually keep people in the role, I think, again, it comes from the top. So you need to be investing in mentorship and coaching. And as a BDR leader, I can tell you that I can do as much as possible and I can invest all of my time into my team, but it takes a village. So as a BDR leader, if you're struggling and you're feeling like almost single threaded with your team or the only person that they're getting mentorship from is you, I would encourage you to pull in your sales leaders, to pull in your marketing leaders, to pull in your alliances leaders and any your sales engineer leaders, any other leaders in the business who can offer investment to these BDRs who are potentially in the first throes of their career And make sure that they feel seen, that they find mentors and sponsors that they connect with, because there's only so much that one leader can do. And it's accepting that, accepting my own limitations, I think has really helped push the team out of just the BDR organization. And they're really seen by the entire office in London as the talent pipeline that other managers can pull from at any time, right? So one thing is having them have mentorship and coaching, not just from you as a leader, that's a given, that's your role but also across the entire company. I think also you need to understand fundamentally what motivates people because it will be different. Sometimes it is just money and success for other people, even sending, for example, for me, sending me abroad was incredibly impactful for me and for my career and for my tenure at Zora. So you need to understand what people are interested in 
And the more that you do that and the more that you give them opportunities to do things as they progress outside of their daily job, the more likely they are to stay past that year and a half mark. And I think that kind of clarity and honesty is not something that we hear too often in terms of the actual business development profession. And I think building that pipeline for both the business from a leads perspective and qualified opportunities, but also for the AEs, they do need to see that progression path. They need to see what's it going to look like for me here in this organization in three years time. And I think that's, that really puts quite a fine point on it, to be honest. Yeah. I think it's understanding what their why is, and then connecting that to what the why is of the company. So for example, at Zora, I'm not sure when the next AE role will open up, right? I'm not sure when that next spot will be. All I can do with my team is make sure that they're as prepared as possible. And to be quite honest with you, I can hold my hand up and say that I'm still working on that. We are still working on a path. We are still working on enablement program around BDR to AE. And I don't think it will ever be perfect, but It's making sure that they see that we're growing and that even though there's no path in sight today, that this spot will open in X months because that's just not how scaling SaaS companies work. And you have to hire people who accept that kind of level of uncertainty and will embrace that. I think that's an absolutely brilliant way to finish up the show. A really inspiring message from a business development leader here in EMEA. Thank you, Kelly Orcutt, for for joining us today on the show. Check it out at zuora.com. And we look forward to hearing you again on the Revenue Optimization Radio. Thank you. You've been listening to Revenue Optimization Radio with your host, Sean Broderick, on the Funnel Radio channel. Podcasts of this live program are available from RevenueOptimizationRadio.com and all your favorite podcast apps, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and more. The sponsor for this program has been Upland Altify.